In Jewish culture, and especially during Jesus' time, the study of the Torah or the Hebrew Bible was extremely important. Not, not only did they view it as it contained the words of God given to them, but also it contained their history, their identity, their culture. So they, they held it to extremely high uh, esteem. And it was so important that it was typical for all Jewish boys and some girls to go to a Jewish equivalent of an elementary school starting at around five or six years of age. And during that time, they learned to study, recite, and interpret the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And by the age of 12 or 13, Jewish children would have memorized the entire Torah by heart. I mean, you think we're behind, right? By 12 or 13, they memorized every single word of the first five books of the Bible. And at that point, for most of the students, their formal education would have been completed. They would then go home and, and learn a trade, maybe a carpentry or um, something along those lines. Uh, for, the most, for the best and the most talented of that bunch, they would be encouraged to study at a second level of education, in which would include the study of commentaries, teachings, and legal analysis from some of the greatest Jewish teachers, uh, religious teachers of all time. And by the end of that level of education, at around 18 to 20 years old, they would have memorized, get this, the entire Old Testament. Every single word of the Old Testament memorized by heart. And at this point, the vast majority of Jewish young men, they were done with education. They would get married, raise families, work on their trade, and hope by the end of their life to have been found faithful. But the best of the best, the, the greatest of the crop, the, the best of the most talented of the best of the most talented, well, then they would then be encouraged to try to apprentice under a rabbi, a master of the Jewish faith. Now, applying to a rabbi was a little bit different from applying to, uh, wouldn't be much different than applying to an Ivy League school today. Think about your, uh, your Stanford, your Caltech, your Harvard, your Yales, all of those things. Uh, this was the equivalent. And to apply, what you had to do was you go to a rabbi that you wanted to follow, and you got on your knees, and you begged, and you begged, and you begged, please, 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 accept me into your discipleship. Accept me as your follower. And if that rabbi was intrigued enough by you, intrigued enough by your pleas, he would then proceed to grill you on your knowledge of Torah, your interpretation of Bible passages, your philosophy, your devotion to God, and so on. And after all of this grilling, if he thought highly enough of you after that, he would then extend his hand and say something along the lines of, come follow me. And so began a process in which you literally followed this rabbi 24 seven. You walked where he walked, stayed where he stayed, listened to everything he taught, watching every act that he did. And why did it have to be this way? Why this type of education? Uh, why was this like this? Because the goal of the disciple was not just to learn from the rabbi, it was to become like him to become like him in every single way, both word and in action. And how would you become like your rabbi? Well, by being with him 24 seven and literally following him around, living with him, following his instructions and imitating his actions and his manners in the everyday and the mundane parts of life, both in the public and the private aspects of your life, you are to imitate this rabbi. And this kind of education is very different from the one we're used to growing up in, in the West, right? Where we go to a classroom, we're all sitting in this classroom and a lecturer comes and uh, gives a speech and we all just soak it all in. And yet it's this concept of whole life apprenticeship that Jesus Christ intends for us when he said the words, follow me. But to follow a Jewish rabbi, to become his disciple, was a highly prestigious and exclusive honor in the Jewish culture. It was one that was reserved for the cream of the crop, the most intelligent, the most knowledgeable, the most deserving. And as we know, that circle is really small. 
So what we have here is the cultural norm for the Jews of Jesus's time. They're really setting us up the context for what we're going to look at today. And it makes it all the more curious that how Jesus approached his role as a rabbi, as Lord, and particularly the people that he invited to follow him. So we're going to look at four passages in Mark today, and the first is going to be from Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Uh, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that's Peter, and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the higher servants and followed him. So who were Jesus' first disciples? Fishermen. Right? Knowing what we've known so far, right? these are hardly up-and-coming biblical scholars at the top of their respective field. Literally, their job as fishermen was to go out into a boat, throw out a net, and then hope to haul in enough fish to feed their families. And they did that every single day, day in, day out. These were the kids who didn't make it past the first level of Jewish education. Yeah, these are the ones where they said, yeah, you, you, tried, you tried your best, you memorized the Torah, okay, now go, go find a trade to do. These are people no self-respecting rabbi would ever consider to be disciple-worthy material. But not to Jesus. Not in the eyes of God. And on top of that, Jesus does something that's a little bit of an eyebrow-raising kind of thing, something very interesting. That instead of the disciple coming to the rabbi and begging to follow him, like we just saw, right? This is the, the way you would apply to follow a rabbi. You came to him, and he made the decision. Notice what Jesus does. It was a rabbi who reached out to the student to invite him, to follow him. That we have Jesus here approaching these fishermen who are hard at work, they're sweating away, throwing out the nets, and he gives them this invitation. And knowing what we know about the background to Jesus' ministry, you can just kind of imagine putting yourself in the shoes of, of Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, that Jesus walks up to them knowing who they are with their limitations and and gives them this invitation to be his disciple. The thoughts are kind of like, well, why would this rabbi come to me and offer me this opportunity to follow him? I'm not anything impressive. I'm your run-of-the-mill fisherman. I don't offer very much. I'm nobody worth that kind of attention. And yet Mark records their response to Jesus' invitation as immediate. As soon as, the, as soon as that invitation was given out, they dropped their nets and they immediately followed Jesus. Why? Because they knew that that offer was too good to be true. And that's why they were going to jump on that as fast as they could because they knew they hit the jackpot. 